Good morning. So, by thinking, can we arrive at understanding? What do you think? <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about this. <laughs> um, actually, something came to me while we were sitting here this morning, which is that it's, it sums it up beautifully in Spanish. There are two verbs for um, the idea of knowing. There's saber, which is to know knowledge, and there's conocer, which has a more intimate, personal feeling about it. You, um, you use conocer when you speak about people or places that you have lived and know well. Um, and saber is restricted to uh, knowledge and the mind and facts and yes, I know that, no, I don't know that. And so on this level of talking about by thinking, can we arrive at understanding, there's, there's steps along the way. Yes, of course, we need thought and we need clarity of thought. I am, um, I'm a teacher here at Living Wisdom School, which is a school uh, inspired by and um, really centered in yogic philosophy, the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda in its deepest sense, which is not uh, a sectarian teaching, but a universal truth. And we work with our students constantly to help them develop clarity of thought, um, but also clarity of heart and deepening intuition and uh, wisdom, which is far, far beyond uh, the thinking, rationalizing, um, separating mind. And uh, so here we are. Yes, we have to come into our day-to-day -day, uh, life, and we have to work our way through problems um, and situations and, and questions, and we have to be able to think with clarity. But if that's as far as we want to go, then we're falling far short of our potential. Um, I was thinking about hiking. And if, if you want to summit a mountain, you probably will begin by researching and studying um, routes up the mountain, maybe the flora and the fauna, maybe learning about the geographical features of the area. You have to gather knowledge. We have to gather um, philosophy on the spiritual path. We have to understand what it is that we're looking for, but we're not going to understand it. We're not going to know it. We're not going to be able to use the verb conocer, to know, until we've gotten ourselves to the mountain and we've gotten out and we've got begun the journey. So we need a lot more than just thinking about life, thinking about God, thinking about whatever it is that's before us. Um, how do we expand beyond just the rational mind? Um, if we want to climb the mountain, Maybe you get out of the car in the parking lot and the first thing that you do is you look up and you see the peak. And you set your uh, intention of where you want to go. And then you bring with you all of the knowledge that you've gained, the, the information that will help you take the journey. But you also bring with you willpower. And you bring with you your physicality, your body, so that you can move yourself through the journey. And hopefully, along the way, your willpower transforms into not just a grim determination to make it to the top, but a willingness to face whatever is in front of you on the path, whether it's a beautiful meadow or a challenging slope, um, whether we're walking through life with uh, an enjoyable circumstance, um, or we're facing one of the most difficult challenges of our lives, can we bring a willingness to say, okay, this is what is in front of me. This must be part of my 
journey. This must be part of my path. How can I embrace it? How can I open to it in a more and more full way? And then, of course, we need to, if we really want to know something, we need to step into relationship with it. We need to open our hearts and our minds, our essence, to connect with it, um, to be able to relate to it beyond the, I know this and this and this and this about it, but to know it. Um, I'm going to make a plug here. This is a book that just came out. It's written by Bharat. He's uh, internationally known as Joseph Cornell. He is a naturalist. And he is um, really leading the way in nature education for children and for adults. This book is called Deep Nature Play. I can't recommend it enough. Um, but he, he talks about a woman who is a, she's a molecular biologist. And she has made some really groundbreaking discoveries um, in genetics. She works, she works with corn genes and chromosomes. Um, but she talks about how she's done it. And she, uh, like Einstein, says that none of her discovery has come from rational thinking. She says, the more I worked with them, with the chromosomes, the bigger and bigger they got. And when I was really working with them, I wasn't outside. I was part of the system and everything got big. I was able to see the internal parts of the chromosomes it surprised me because I actually felt as if I were right down there and these were my friends. Imagine if we could go through life speaking with a colleague, driving in traffic, um, looking at your favorite tree in the backyard and not feel that you were separate from it but that you were with it, in it, a part of it, connected to it, would that change our understanding? Would that take us beyond thinking about it and bring us into a knowing of it? I think so. Um, as I mentioned, I teach here at Living Wisdom School, and uh, one of the areas of study for my second grade students is, um, is often trees. And so several years back, we were studying all about trees. And because I'm familiar with Bharat's work, I bring in a lot of um, sharing nature experiences, which don't only teach facts about nature, although they do and they teach them in a deep way because these activities and games that he's developed take the student, adult student, child stu student, all of us, into an experience of whatever it is that we're learning about. And then those little facts, they plant themselves, just like seeds in really fertile soil, and they stay with you because you are, you're, you're living in an experience of whatever it is that you're learning. So um, we were studying trees and we had been in the classroom, we'd been, uh, oh gosh, with our bodies making the layers of a tree so we could understand its anatomy and building vests with all of the layers inside. So they're internalizing information in a lot of ways. Um, but I still felt like the, the children weren't, they weren't connecting yet. They weren't feeling what it was to be connected to this form of life. And so we just went to our local park here and I had them do something called uh, interview with nature. And what it is, uh, you can do it with a tree, you can do it with a flower, you can do it with a squirrel, if you can get the squirrel to sit still long enough. <laughs> um, 
you go and you sit and you get quiet and calm, and whether it's verbal or mental, you begin asking questions to this bit of nature. And so I, I helped my kids. We had a, a list of questions that I wanted them to ask. And it was, it was things that when you first hear them, you're going to think they're silly. What's your name? Um, how do you feel right now? What do you like to do? What do you like to see? I mean, it was things that you might ask a, a friend, somebody that you're uh, getting to know for the first time. And so I sent my, my kids out, and I told them, you can ask other questions too. Um, write down their, the answers. So they went off into the park, and they each found their own tree. And um, one little girl, she found a tree that had about three or four different uh, trunks coming out from the central trunk. And so she could actually climb inside the tree. And she sat down in the little nook there, and um, she asked her questions. And she, like many others, came back, and they wanted to tell me the answers that they had found out. Now, they couldn't have just been using their rational minds because you and I can sit there and we can ask a tree all day long what its name is and it is not going to tell you if you're using your rational mind. But if you use your heart mind, if you tap into an intuitive relationship with that organism, it surely has an answer. And if you can listen carefully enough, you'll hear it. So she came back, they all came back, and they wanted to tell me, and they wanted to tell each other, and um, it, was, it was lovely. And I, I felt like we left from that experience with them relating to their study of trees in a much deeper way, in a way that would carry them through life with a, a link between themselves and the natural world. But it didn't end there. For the rest of the year, every time I saw this little girl at the park, we go there three times a week as a school, the first thing she would do before she would sit and eat her lunch, before she would play on the playground, she would run across the grass, jump into the little nook in the tree, and sit there, sometimes for 30 seconds, sometimes for five minutes. She said hello to her tree every single time we went to the park. And she often came back to report and tell me what it had to say. <laughs> What if we did that? What if you left today and you took two minutes to um, offer a thought of appreciation to the plants in the courtyard? Or you saw someone at the bagel bar after service and you didn't go up and start chatting with them right away, but from across the room, you looked at them and you tried to really see them, be with them, know them, from heart to heart, from heart mind to heart mind, from essence to essence. Try it. Um, again, in preparation for this, I was doing some research, and um, part of that was to just see what other ministers had shared. And there were beautiful talks online. Uh, but one of them struck me. And it was, it was a talk by Ananta at Ananda Village. And he read something from this book about Rajasi Janakananda. And it, it's a letter from uh, Paramahansa Yogananda to Rajasi. And he read it. And I thought, oh, I love this. I want to share it. So I got out the book and I started looking. You know, I even looked on the, the screen to see about how far through the book <laughs> was he open to, could I find it, and um, I looked and I looked and I looked and I looked and I could not find it. So I put it down and I thought, okay, well that's not trying to happen, I'm just going to leave it alone. Um, I wasn't using my heart mind though, I was, I was stuck in my rational, about how far into the book is it, can I find it, what page would it be on, what, I looked in the you know, the table of contents, what chapter might that be in? Um, couldn't find it at all. And then I was going about my, my day, and I all of a sudden just got this little, it wasn't a thought, it was, it was a pause, it was a, a spark. And I uh, 
I glanced over at a picture of, of Yogananda, which was right there, and he just looked like he had a little sparkle in his eye. And, um, and then I saw the book, and I thought, huh, I think I'll try one more time. And I opened it to the exact page. So this is for you, and it's for me. This is a letter that he wrote while he was in India in um, 1935. And he's writing to his foremost disciple, Rajasi Janakananda. And he's speaking about how we can go beyond the rational mind and begin to connect with spirit, with devotion, with love that, that connects us through the light of creation. And so in a sense, this is your assignment. I know I already gave you one, but I'm a teacher, so here's another. Um, but this assignment isn't really from me. It's from, it's from Master. I am sitting in front of a window. I see life force lifting and flapping the wings of sparrows. And in the flowing wind, and in the moving leaves, and in the white blue sky, and in the layers of brick walls, and in the bone and flesh cells of my body. The white sky, the cream-colored houses, the brown bodies, the green trees, the gray sparrows, are different vibrations of the same life force. Oh, what magic light with so many changing vibrations. When you look at anything, look at it steadily until your inner light comes out and drowns that object. This is part of the assignment. I'm going to read that again. When you look at anything, look at it steadily until your inner light comes out and drowns that object. And then you will see that object transformed into life force. This is a new way of converting solids liquid lakes and skies into the light of life force. Solids have dimensions and hardness. It is condensed life force that vibrates dimensions and hardness. The worldly man experiences the world as walking on solids, swimming in water, flying in the clouds. The yogi must feel himself moving in light for the body is light and all is light. Forsake human habits. Utilize your self-realization to cultivate yogi habits and God habits. Yogis walk in light. Feel and see the body as light. The world is not the same as the world perceives it. The yogi must perceive the world as bundle as a bundle of sensations springing from the different vibrations of life force. So, dear one, perceive the world now as a motion picture on the screen of your consciousness and in the sky. With my love and the blessings of gurus, I remain very sincerely yours. Look for light. Look for connection that doesn't spring from here, but from here. And that's directed inwardly and upwardly so that as we walk our journey and our path, we have in sight the mountain peak, but we meet each rock, each step, each, each moment along the way with willingness, with an open heart and with an open mind as well. See the light in each other and the light in the world. Thank you. <laughs>